When it comes to stunning American landscapes in color, there is one person that comes to mind. And for me, that is Jacob Lulha Ruiz, a photographer also known as Portrait Poppy online, who has created one of the most beautiful collections of captivating American landscapes on film. And today on Thoughts and Process, I have the pleasure of interviewing him and unfold the layers behind his creative process. In this 50 minute interview, we touch on why he prefers to shoot film over digital, capturing feelings rather than sharpness, and provides insight on how he is able to live and travel out of his car to make some of the most beautiful photographs of America. This is the Jacob Lulha Ruiz interview. Dude, hey. how long has it been since we've kind of interacted online and finally this is our first time meeting in person? Yeah, I don't know. I've been watching your videos for a long time. I would say like when I was shooting when I probably first started shooting a lot on the Canon, working at a shitty Photoshop up in, in the North Bay and, <laughs> and just trying to get inspired. And there's not a lot of Bay Area people, so thank yeah. you for being one of them. What's this building right here? Where are we at? This is the Frank Lloyd building at uh, San Rafael City Center or Civic Center. So if you want to get married, go to court, go to holding. If you get arrested, it's all here. <laughs> this is a really good place to get arrested at. <laughs> exactly. You know, today, you guys, we are with somebody that I personally look up to. Oh, uh, for years and years, I followed your Instagram and just, you know, appreciated your work. And you're from the Bay Area, so it's, it's super cool to kind of get you in on this interview series. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Jacob Leah Ruiz. Hello, hello. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to the YouTube space, man. Are you, aren't you going to start a channel soon? Yeah, I'm known as Portrait Poppy online. Yes. Sadly, I've just, uh, I did that because one of my profile pictures, actually my dad smoking a joint in the 70s. <laughs> uh, so that's how that kind of started. But yeah, starting up some more stuff, just taking photos, trying to enjoy life and, and make some meaningful work. I'm just curious, I got to ask you, where did that name stem from in the first place? Was it that your dad's photo or? Um, it was a mix. I had a friend, uh, Emily, who we call Pas Pastel Poppy, and she started calling me Portrait Poppy, and eventually all of just the homies become some version of Poppy, so everyone has a different one. We got Texture Poppy, which is a homie <laughs> named Eric, and just everyone got their different version, so I became the Portrait one. I have a strong addiction to Portra. It is the only thing that makes me sad is spending my whole bank account on Portra, but it's worth it, you know? Yeah. Shout out to Kodak. There Love people like Tim out there. But yeah, it all kind of started from that, and it was a different way. Um, I was already on social media at the time. I've been on IG for multiple years. I was focused on landscape, trying to get like a very clinically precise image, mm -hmm. and that was a lot of traveling, how it started, and I kind of found myself like, I don't know, dissatisfied. I was so focused on like a perfect image that the feeling off it didn't didn't hold the same regard so eventually I started shooting some film I actually started that account on the side while already having one and I secretly just didn't tell anybody I just grew it and it kind of just took over as time went on but it's just one of those things that kind of just snowballed and then I couldn't stop doing it and yeah. I saved up film for like a year straight I worked at like a shitty camera store in the hood we get robbed we get like what? crackheads and trying to steal batteries and stuff and like it just kind of sucked I was just like a tech support for old people setting up their iPads and a camera store is where they chose. Um, but through that, I ended up just buying film there and keeping it in a freezer bag in my fridge just for like a year straight. And eventually when I turned it in, it like changed how I saw photography. I forgot all these moments happened and I had like, I have like some of my favorite images that I didn't even know I took like saved for so long, it became like just more meaningful. I was like surprised. It, it, it was a new exciting way to take this version of something I already loved and like relight that fire, but like full steam ahead. It was it was awesome. I, I very much it got like addicting and like that little page just started as a real estate channel that was dormant for like years, never did anything with it and just ended up like slowly putting out work and then it turned into something, I guess. On this journey right now, you're mostly shooting film? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm strictly on film. I don't really have a lot of options though because uh, you know I love the, the M6. I, I eventually yeah. saved up for this dream camera, um, but I shot most of my photos on like a cheap Canon AE-1. It was just like 
$100. I got it at like a thrift store or garage sale and I already had a lens attached. Eventually got a 28 mil and I used it for like two plus years. I didn't really need a bunch of other cameras and eventually I got into like 120 and then saved up for like a Mamiya 7, but I ended up shooting the Canon like more out of just any camera I owned and it just, uh, I don't know, it became a workhorse for me. And as time went on to afford film, I slowly would like sell a digital lens here, or maybe sell like an extra body here. And then eventually I just ran out of digital gear and I started collecting a bunch of film and a couple hundred rolls of, you know, over time. And it, it kind of just became its own thing. So I don't really have an option. I shoot film now and I sometimes take BTS photos on my, my phone. Yeah, honestly, everybody would love an M6. Like you think of your dream camera growing up and you just want something that's a part of history. And that was like a big thing for me. I'm like, if I could have a similar camera that like my idol shot on, there's, you know, the only thing that's different is the time we're in and like the places we go. So it was one of those things that we all shoot on the same color stock. We all shoot with a similar tool. So I think the creative choice is even higher. Absolutely. because we're all on the same playing field and we just want to see good film photos. So you, you once said you wanted to focus on capturing feelings rather than sharpness. Yeah. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, I, uh, I started out in landscape, which is the favorite sport for 50-year-old men plus with tripods that sit in the same spot and they like to stack you know, every couple of feet at any national park, you'll see them in the wild. We call them tripod uncles. Tripod uncles. So I grew up with those tripod uncles. I love them. Ooh, I, that, yeah. was, that was my crew. I had um, not a lot of people shooting landscape uh, around my age. And I had one friend in the Bay Area who would shoot with me a bunch, Cody Mayer. And it was cool to kind of like have that group, have that outdoor interest, but it was so much focused on like technicalities. I would shoot like exposure sacks, uh, luminosity blend everything. It was like all this effort for single frames that I would like edit and not be happy with. I would take like an hour of editing and be like, oh cool, now I know I don't like this frame. So let's move to the next one. And it was just one of those things that I didn't have that feeling you get from certain photos. And like film at least showed me like the imperfections you do get is, is so, you know, randomized. So like snowflake-esque, everything is a little different. Every start of the roll burn is a little different. And like, I would cherish when I would get those imperfections. And it started to like turn some gears where I'm like hoping that I get like light leaks. And I'm hoping that I had these like just weird circumstance kind of situations that would pop up. And the more I would just focus on like a clinically correct frame, the less exciting it would be. You know, and I think that's kind of what pushed me away from it, sadly. It was just one of those things that like, the feeling you get from a photo is infinitely more important about how correct it is. And sharing your settings to someone doesn't help them, you know, see what's going on. If yeah. photography is a visual language, we're all speaking it already. We are all versed in it. We grew up looking at images and you know when something hits. And if you yeah. can like trust a gut feeling, that's like, that's the best signal in the world. You said it best, man. I know exactly what you mean when you say if it hits and you can feel it. Yeah. It's a whole different And experience. you can like feel it, feel it. Yeah. And that and if it hits too hard, then you just never put down the camera again. And that's kinda that's what starts us down the road. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what, you, you have such a, a unique style. Like when I see a photo, I can almost tell it's just from you just based off of how it looks. In the past, what were more of your artistic influences? What helped you shape that style? And how would you describe your style today if you know someone were to just meet you for the first time? Definitely. Dude, I have to first say thank you, because like I think every photographer just hopes one day that someone's like oh I just recognize that photo because yeah. it looks like yours and like <laughs> that's like oh my god it's so hard to get into that place I feel I think in general like a style is something everyone tries to hunt after and it's for me it's like a culmination of everything you're interested in like the people you talk to the way you grew up the things that you like outside of photography makes what becomes like known as your preference or style and not liking photos gets you closer to that than liking every single photo in the world and I don't know for me I I really just shot a lot of golden hours I really enjoy like that soft light aesthetic I shoot on a similar film stock so a lot of things kind of relate in the same color universe but mm -hmm. 
I don't know, for me, when I'm taking photos, it's just the act of photography. I don't really think about it. I don't focus on anything. I have a couple frames that I always love to catch, like out the side of a car window. I've been shooting the same match frame for years, just collecting, and I don't, I don't know why. It's just like one of those things where I'm like, okay, maybe I just want, want this extra trading card. Let me put this Pokemon card, you know, <laughs> in the back pocket and just keep I collecting them. But yeah. eventually it adds up and it becomes something. I don't think we can choose directly the more we push in a direction you know it sometimes becomes harder and you get a little lost because you're like pursuing an interest that you don't you need to dedicate your whole life to but mm -hmm. as long as you like follow that momentum and feel like you're enjoying what you create usually it all relates back in the same way and every couple of years we switch everything up and decide to tear the walls down and start anew the work will speak once you have enough of it to relate to each other I think like it's easier to let the art decide then to be like, oh, I'm gonna go outside and anybody with an umbrella and a fedora, they're mine. I'm like sniping people out here. Like I'm, I'm hunting, you know, sneaking around corners, following old folks. Like I think it's easier just to shoot anything that interests you. And if we like, hopefully are all aiming at this like long time we can take photos, maybe in like 40 years, you get to see a super strong commonality towards all your work. And you know, once you're looking only at like a year, it's, it's a little harder to see all the common points. But the more times you revisit things and the more times you shoot, you know, there's good photos everywhere at any time, as long as we're out there looking. You, you have photos from all different parts of the country. How do you go about deciding where you're gonna go, what you're gonna pack, and what you're gonna do? Yeah, Focus through that process. I'm uh, I'm voluntarily homeless. <laughs> Maybe that's not the best way to put it, but I travel out of my vehicle, so it really allows me to to travel kind of with the seasons. You know, in the summers, go up to the mountains, the snow melts, you get to see more. Mm -hmm. In the winters, you go towards the coast. It's a little bit easier to live, and it's nice to you know stay with people, friends, family, uh, to kind of fill in the gaps. But I've been traveling like primarily road-based since like 2019, 2020. So I would take a lot, you know, half the year on the road, half the year in an apartment and try to make that work financially. But just in general, I think it's like, I only got to go places because I, I put like the most focus on travel. Like I would be like, I set up a platform in my car, set up drawers, sliders, so I can so cook cool. and live. And yeah. it's fun, but it's like the most taxing. So you go through these waves of like, I want to see everything. And then you go to through winter sessions of like, I don't want to go anywhere. I just want to sit with work, edit, be a normal person. Yeah. So it's a little bit of both, a little bit of like voluntary vagabond dirtbag lifestyle and then <laughs> a little overseas travel and stay in some places. But I feel like sometimes you just got to like set a path and a little bit of trusting the process. You know, if you're doing something like obsessively and you have to do it, you just like find ways that it kind of naturally figures stuff out. And sometimes you just gotta go and figure it out later and like take those opportunities. And I, I suggest that to anybody. Like honestly, if you have family, if you have friends, like getting out of your normal routine as a person, like lets you see life differently. It gets to forcefully like change your perspective. If you can't understand the language or you're going somewhere new or something scary, you're in the middle of nowhere and you have to do it by yourself, which is the most motivation to kind of make happen. But like if you're if you feel like you have to do it, like you'll find a way. You'll that's kind of way. that's kind of what I've relied on. And if it, if it doesn't work out, I'm still going in some kind of direction. So we'll see where, yeah. <laughs> where it lands. And that's a tough thing to do, right? Because I think nowadays everybody wants that certainty. I want to ask you here, what, what drives you to be such a creative, you know, is there an end goal? Is there something that you're working towards? I, I honestly, grown up, struggled with school, tried to find a career path that would make any sense. I had, you know, part of my family who came from overseas, so it was like, you know, immigrant in America, it's like you gotta do good, you gotta make a living, earn something. I got all the way here. If you can't keep going, we got a problem. Yeah. Um, You're but, doing great, man. Yeah. you know, half of that was also like, uh, you know, struggling with school, having different languages in the house, I think it became easier to use photo and video to explain things. I spent a lot of time on YouTube as a kid, I spent a lot of time on the internet just because it was like, if you don't have a lot of family who lives in the US, you kind of make family. You get those friends and they become really close friends and you just like bond with people like that. So 
I think the passion comes from like trying to find like some direction in life, using like the interest to be like, oh, you know, I want to do something outside of just manual labor. I don't want to just go through life and do the same things and just make enough to survive. And I've like grown up like that, check to check, where it's like, dude, I don't, I'm over that. You don't have to do anything in this world. And if you're gonna, you know, put yourself through all this punishment and pain just to like make someone else happy or like satisfy like an expectation, like it, it you come to these moments where you're like oh shit this is like just not worth it like I'm not satisfied you know I'm sure plenty of people have been in a job that they don't like but it's required to make a living and eventually like I came to the point where I had my passion to overtake my priorities good or bad maybe um, and I found that like with photography if you have a tool that lets you document life yeah. you start paying attention to like little things that is it's almost like magic like yeah. shit will happen in front of your eyes that you can't believe because you're ready to see it and if you don't have that tool or if you don't have that perspective you can go to life like blind and not see all these like amazing little moments just because you know you're not tuned into it and I think for me that is like what changed with photography where like it was such a passion for so long and I just wanted to do it with all of my free time would save money for gas do little trips around that like once I opened that door and I got to see all these cool things that were happening I couldn't unsee it yeah. I'd be at work staring at a, a weather cam in the Bay Area yeah. looking at low fog at the bridge and being like oh I'm gonna quit today like yeah. I'm over this like you know that happens for a week straight and you start to reprioritize everything so I think it's just like a, a snowball like I have to take photos because like once you start that process it's it's done you, you you get sucked into it and I don't I don't want to see a different version of life now that I have this it's like kind of cool to, to sit comfortably in that spot I know that means you've been through your fair share of struggles and trials and tribulations but it's nice to have something like I think Oh, dude, I would, it's almost sad, but I think everyone needs a thing. Like, they need something to do passionately, even if it's a hobby, even if it's pastime. I think the more people in the world that create things just make a happier place to live. Um, but, like, everybody needs their thing. It sucks to, like, go through life and be constantly looking and constantly switching things. And I think a lot of people, their main hobbies are, like, sitting down, drinking, smoking, watching TV. And I grew up with plenty of people like that. I still have them in my life. But if I didn't, like, step away from that, and I'm sure it's the same for you, if you don't sure. step away, dude, that becomes your whole life. And it's like, what are we, you know, it's a, a very relaxing leisurely lifestyle that becomes dangerous you get sedentary and you don't want to go out and yeah. exit your home environment and dude yeah without some kind of passion I bet it'd be kind of lost and I think a lot of people are it's, it's sad but I'm yeah. glad we found something <laughs> right have you ever ventured out into other styles and genres of photography or do you even approach it in that way like where you just a landscape focused you know, type of photographer. How does that work for you? Yeah, I think uh, I started with landscape, so it's like my natural interest for the outdoors is always there. I originally started with a lot of portraiture, so I've like spent like a year to two years on like different segment blocks, but landscape's probably like the the one that's kind of lasted the longest. There's always been like an underlying base of landscape, but I really love environmental portraits. I want to put people in frames and like, I don't know, feel like it's like a movie. Like I love seeing perspectives where like people, like the natural people, the locals are like the main characters. And I think there's just a thing about, you know, special places in the US, either New York, uh, SF, LA, different cities. There's like these strange, interesting characters that like come through and they're always there and you kind of have to hunt out for them. And they feel like the main characters of the story. If everyone's NPCs, that's like a quest line right there. Yeah. And sometimes I have to go up and talk to them, get a portrait, shoot. I usually shoot them candidly and then go up and conversate after and just see what I can pull from it. If not, just an interesting conversation yeah. with the human. And yeah, you know, what started landscape, I feel like has just prepared me to shoot I don't know, whatever is there. I'm happy to like jump between topics or focus on different bodies of work, but I really like to see how like a cultural influence comes to a place, either like through architecture and buildings, like this beautiful place yeah, we're in, gorgeous. or like, you know, the mountain huts that are on top of, you know, different ranges across the world that have their own culture and history embedded in them. I think it's cool when humans interact with the natural world and they get to create something because, you know, 
with that, it feels like a little bit of like a cultural fingerprint. Like I think that's why, like for classic cars, you know, everyone loves a classic car. If you for shoot sure. film, you like a good classic car. Yeah, don't you, lie about it. You know you, you, know you <laughs> like that. You know, a classic car, like anything else, or like nothing else, is a specific year, and it like takes a specific time in history, and you get to like pretend you're in that era. So when you're a bunch of, around a bunch of like 80 muscle cars, classic, like if you're just showing the scene and the environment like that, it feels like you just stepped into the 80s. Oh, for and sure. I think that's like super nice with different topics. And when you get to go overseas and see different places, like you don't have to like be in that same timeline. Like you really get to step into somewhere else. And it, it kind of feels cool to jump between like different topics like that. Six years ago, you went on a road trip to LA. Do the names Caliotto and Coach Trees ring a bell? Dude. Are you actually Nardvar? How do you know this? <laughs> oh you know, my god. I do my research so that Dude. we could tell your story. Wow. So how was that experience? I know you were talking about like portraits and whatnot. But Oh my um, god. Does that type of like drive and passion to create like still live within you today? Yeah, holy smokes. Um, to touch on that, that was like two friends who used to make music in the Bay. And I shot like concerts for them, shot some music videos. I was working mainly in video on cameras, not doing as much photo. Um, and that trip down south to LA, we just stayed in like a producer buddy's LA apartment with barely any furniture and sleeping on the floor and creating like music videos and doing stuff downtown. It was just one of those like first like like, oh fuck it, let's just go and figure yeah, it out. Yeah. Like, just make it or break it kind of stuff where like they wanted to follow music and I really wanted to do photo and art and be around that scene. I was, that was one of the first trips where it was just like, oh, let's just figure it out. Let's go down south, stay with a homie. And we actually stayed with like a producer and an artist that were bigger at the time. So they gave some like kind words of help and wisdom and pushed us along our way. But that was like one of the first, like, I have no idea what I'm doing. It's just like, let's go. Let's just figure it out. I'll be gone for a week. Let's just go for it. Let's just go for it. We have a place to stay. Yeah, I've been trying to pull back on just traveling for the sake of travel. I feel like the last couple of years I would roam the US. I just wanted to see things and I would just go to small towns and different destinations and travel a lot with friends doing the same kind of thing where like we had a community of people who live on the road and travel and explore and I really love that lifestyle. I got like ingrained with like the, the habits of that and figuring out like, you know, gym memberships to shower and, you know, oh, see, yeah. different places to get the best bang for your buck for food so you could save some for later kind of deal. And, all of that kind of went into like just roaming for the sake of roaming. And I've like done so much of that now, I'm kind of drawing back and focusing on like, okay, out of these years of doing this, where are my long-term projects? What do I really care about? And what do I want to build into maybe a book or like just like a dedicated part of our archive because the world is constantly changing. You know, there's might be a very aesthetic building there one year that's gone the next. SF is constantly moving around and changing. Like the world is going at a pace where it feels like you have to document things before they're gone. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the biggest driving elements. It's like, I want to see these things before they're gone, before the world kind of like, a little bit homogenizes and becomes like you know the age of the internet everyone's kind of tuned into the same things everyone's aware of the same music like there's certain places in the world that are just cut off from anything that like have their own kind of fingerprint and I was so focused on seeing those places that now I'm moving into a, an era of like picking those trips dedicating those times to like different storylines or different people and really like spending the time longer in those places instead of trying to see everything at once which was the best motivation to get on the road mm -hmm. and then like the most taxing way to live life where you're constantly like on the hunt looking out you just want to get a good sunrise or sunset so it always feels worth it and that lifestyle is very like high exciting adrenaline you'll drive like six to ten hours in a day just to be in a new state new place How um, do you do it? <laughs> but enough days spent outside of gas stations just to have service in the middle of nowhere you get to like realize like wow this is like a privilege to do stuff like this and like yeah. vagabond lifestyle compared to to like the people who are working every day, like the blue collar jobs in the small towns, like life's not that exciting when you have to do things like that. So now I go back and I wanna tell like stories like that and like the people, like the main characters of places more than just getting to, to travel for the sake of it. But it all came from like 
loving the dirtbag adventurers that were my idols growing up. Like I wanted people uh, kind of like the Christopher McCandless into the wild oh, story gotcha. where you just set yeah. off. You know, your parents are a little worried, they hope you're okay, and you're just figuring out life and really trying to find like some kind of meeting outside of just the normal interactions. Yeah. Photography is like one of the only art forms where we can't just stay home to create. We have to go out in the world and like capture things and like save them and you know, almost keep them precious until we get back home and get to like permanently save them or develop them and process yep. and like it's like one of the only arts that you can't just make out of nothing. You have to go out into the world, see things, capture things and every time you have like an experience or a change of perspective you get to really like tune into a different topic and you know then you get to rinse and repeat and try to <laughs> try to find yourself in different places honestly outside of anything if you want to like do a photo experience if you just take that like what would be a gear upgrade and spend it on a trip I think it gets way more bang for your mm. buck like I think Facts. going out and like figuring it out um, you don't have to spend a bunch of money I know sleeping in your car can be super uncomfortable but in the summer when it's warmer and there's more space if you have an SUV you have the ability to lay down which just changes how you can live or even if you don't have too much room in your car you can get a storage box on top and keep everything safe out of the way anything that like lets you pull up to a place where you're gonna shoot sunrise or sunset like changes how you can do the experience and you'll going to those beautiful places you'll meet people doing the same thing you just have to end up there at the right time in the right light and you just see the photographers come out of the come out of the rocks and <laughs> start climbing up yeah there. in the time that you've been making photos and kind of telling stories have you ever put an emphasis on chasing contracts or chasing art do you do both or do you feel like it's mostly just for the art What's your take on chasing contracts versus chasing art? Yeah, I only, only work so I can afford to do the art form. Like, wow. the only reason yeah. I do anything is so I can afford to do it. I think every dollar goes back into the, the craft in some way, shape, or form. Um, and I... I put my value to those experiences in photos. Like the biggest flex in the world is not like having a sports car. It's having like a archive of memories saved and organized and documented. Like yeah. you want to flex on someone, you have 20 years organized photos. Damn, oh my God, I, I haven't even met a person in my life that has done like an attempt like that. But yeah. it's just one of those things where there's like necessary evil, so to speak, where like you do have to work to afford things and life's expensive and you need to like, at least get in a position where you know you can have more fun and less stress when you focus on things and you have certain things figured out <laughs> but i always think it's like so worth it to like get that underdog make it out the dirt and like figure it out i think uh the obsession with money is like not everyone's purpose and passion i think the u.s has this like work ethic culture where it's like if you're Absolutely. not working you should like die trying like you yeah. should do this until you fall apart and if it doesn't work it's on you and you need to figure it out or you need to break the rules and like even make it even more worth it and it's just i think it's a negative perspective like for sure yeah if you have a passion and you're willing to work for it and you're willing to drive towards it like you'll slowly figure out the steps as time goes on i don't think anybody can just like give you all the cheat codes to, to, to jump any steps. And if you do skip steps, it only hurts once you get to that end destination too quickly mm -hmm. and you're like flustered or unprepared or dissatisfied or you just feel this like, a common thing for artists is like this imposter syndrome. Like how do you deal with imposter syndrome? And like for me, I just try to build an archive over like multiple years and then I don't have to like pretend to do anything or anything else like I have yeah. such a like long trek ahead that I'm like dude I'm down to hang out on the way but I have to keep walking eventually and like yeah. I'm ready to put my head down for you know another handful of years or blank amount of time to, to get to that spot and once you get to that spot you get to see another mountain or another destination and you're like okay time to walk down to walk back up again. Speaking on the imposter syndrome. That little bag of doubt that we carry on our shoulders, what, what are some ways that you feel like you've been able to calm those nerves, kind of get you out of it? I know you talked about, you know, developing like a huge archive and having that body of work to speak for itself. Uh, but from day to day, how are you able to keep yourself at bay? Ooh, well, 
I'm gonna flip it a little bit and I hope I don't lose that feeling completely, honestly. Mm -hmm. I think having a little bit of like, oh my God, am I supposed to be here, keeps your perspective like way more tuned in. Like yeah, I don't, dude, yeah. I never hope to lean towards the Kanye side and be like, no, I'm meant to be here. I'm doing this. This is like God given. Like I'm a, I think it's always good to have a little bit of doubt, a little bit of like that humility step in like, oh, I'm, I'm figuring it out. I'm open to see what path opens up and take whatever, you know, direction that makes sense at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but the only thing that sucks is like when imposter syndrome stops people from creating. Like there's a, there's a level of pressure we put on ourselves where it's like, oh, if I can't do this perfect, I'd rather not do it. Or if like I can't post every single day, I'd rather post never and be like, oh, I don't care about social media. It's, it's something that doesn't affect it where like there's so many fun and positive sides of like having to care, putting that like burden of responsibility on yourself where you're like, oh, I'm not gonna just call myself a photographer if I take photos twice a year. Like it's, it's one of those things that you get to earn and you get to see people earn their stripes and it's like impressive. It's one of those things where you're like, oh my God, am I supposed to be here in the room is like a benefit where you're like, how did I end up here is awesome. <laughs> um, so I don't know, imposter syndrome, as long as it doesn't stop you from like your goals, I think a little bit of self-doubt is okay. I think it's normal. I think having none is a little dangerous mm -hmm. um, and like trying to get rid of it is, is not the goal. I think like for me, I always tell people like my goal is like sharing a piece of art every day. It's not like how it performs. It's not where it's going regardless of the platform if I like made the ritual of sharing work then that is just part of my everyday and it like gets to build up over time um, I yeah. think there's like a love-hate relationship with social media and I see a lot of people just going through it sometimes like it's unfair like you have so many talented people that like not everyone gets the spotlight they deserve and that just happens and it's it's it sucks because I've seen it in real life not just like the art side it's just part of life and like certain things you have to be you know people are like say like luck is a combination of like being prepared and like taking the opportunity and you can like totally take the opportunity and be unprepared and just let it kind of slip by or be over prepared but not willing to take any risks at all and they both just stop you in your place um, so a little bit of chip on your shoulder makes you push harder and yeah, I hope I don't lose that because that would, that would suck <laughs> <laughs> oh how do you not just burn out. Oh, that's a good topic, like burnout. Create a burnout. To create a burnout, it's a bitch. Oh it my is, God. dude. Do you ever feel like you get tired of the routine that you've developed? Like, at first, it's like, man, this is great. I'm going to go out, I'm going to do this. And you do it so many times, and then eventually you're like, oh, yeah, I, I want to change it up, right? Yeah, I, uh, I've been there so many times. Sometimes I take like a couple days off and I don't do anything photo related, even though it kills me slowly. Um, by the end of that time of taking a break, if anybody does need a break, there's like this drive to get back into it that like slowly builds up. And by the end, you're like, I can't stand not doing this. So yeah. let me jump back into it full force. Um, and I think those, you know, are very important times to take those moments. Um, but burnout is like something that kill, like if there's something that kills artists more than anything else besides the median, like any kind of art form, it's like people quitting because the, the constant pressure is too big. And I think that's the saddest part. Like especially if social media makes people stop making art, then I don't think you need to focus on social media or any person that needs to focus on the thing that's making them not create as much. Uh, but for me, creative burnout has happened like plenty of times and I hope it keeps on happening because every time you burn out, you like kind of orient your direction a little bit where you're yeah, like, dude, right. I've done this so much. I have to look at something else and I'd rather get lost in a rabbit hole than like st slam your head against the wall repeatedly. Yeah. But I've been so burnt out on the road where like your whole dedication is to be there for photography that I feel like just a loser. Like I've been in my car, I've shed some tears, thought like, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing with this time? Am I taking advantage of my life? Like, am I actually doing something meaningful? And you sit there in the middle of nowhere thinking like, what, what's the point of all this? And like, if you don't find that point, you do quit. And if you do find that point, you just keep going. Who would you say is your Mount Rushmore in terms of photographers? Oh, I thought about this a lot. I love photography. So this comes with like a little bit of like my favorite top inspirations slash people who've just been like a big motivator in my process or just goats and like, 
I think one of the classic goats for me is Joel Merowitz. Really? Like, Joel Merowitz is just absolutely the most fascinating person I've heard talk about the art form. I've read multiple books, I've collected a bunch of his work. Um, we even got to do a little brief exchange on Twitter once where I'm like having a heart attack, like, holy shit, this is actually <laughs> Joel Merowitz. Um, he just like, has like a great credibility in the timeline of the history. I think he's done something incredible while like blending the medians, moving into color, even shooting side by side color in black and white for like long, like years worth of work. Um, and has plenty of like Cartea Brisson decisive moments, specifically the photo of the two shadows on the backs of two different people coming right. through the smoke. One of the one of the photos that I saw and I was like, oh, street photography, like it makes sense. Like that's timing to a T. It is the hardest form of photography um, in terms of like what I think is out there in the world, um, which kind of leads me to my next person who I think is like my favorite contemporary street photographer is Jeremy Page, eaten by flowers. Oh my God, Jeremy Page is like, like, just like disgusting good. He's just like <laughs> insane moments that you don't think happen in real life. And it's one of those things where you see the photos and you're like, I can't believe this is real life. And it's, it's all film. He's shooting in uh, downtown LA, Hollywood. He's shooting places that aren't like commonly seen. So when you get to see it, there's like some kind of tourist landmark mixed with just odd reality mm. um, and it's just like a couple of his photos hit so hard it like makes your hair stand on the back of your neck um, and I think in terms of contemporary artists um, he doesn't like share a bunch but when he does he only hits home runs full mm. sets full of like what would take months to get even one of those lineups um, and it's just someone that I've like been very impressed with in the contemporary world. I think during our era in the last five years of photography, especially with film, I think Joe Greer is a name that comes up all Absolutely. the time. Absolutely. Um, yeah. it, it, it's just someone who's like shown a showcase of like travel and street and like just blended everything together. Super good origin story. His last book was like part of his life mixed with photography and I thought it was like super good. Yeah. Um, pretty kind dude talk to him as well and it just seems like he's like had a, such a big imprint especially in the last like five years that I think a lot of people just relate to the work and it's Absolutely. like oh my god that's it just clicks a light on in a lot of people's head um, and that's like another contemporary guy who's like moved to a different stage of his life even now and he's not shooting as much street and he's focusing on family and it's cool to see people progress through that era because like we get to look back at like historic greats go through different stages in their career and oh, yeah. when people are shooting currently it's hard to see that unless they've just been a part of the median for so long. Um, so it's nice to see those those transition moments. Oh, but it's going to be a toss up. I think the Todd Heido, Stephen Shore, new yeah. topographic era of people, um, that, that birth of that genre really started with that uh, group. And it just like has grown to some of my favorite work in the world right now. Um, I think it's uh, Greg for a day is like maybe one of those people I'll, I'll point towards who's like currently sharing um, Greg Gerard is his name. He shot a bunch of like 70s, 80s, 90s, Tokyo, China, just overseas. He's gone That's pretty cool. around a lot. He's constantly online. He's actually doing his own social media. He's an older guy, so it's cool to see that <laughs> in general. But um, that like transition between those landscapes and still lives I think places have as much detail as people and when you get an essence of a place it's like crazy how impactful it can be and I think that's made a big impact on my personal work and like contemporary people like uh, like AV did it on IG he's like one of the friends I've lived with a close friend he does a lot of that style he does a lot of night style and it, to see that generation of like new topographics spread into the new contemporary artists in the last five to ten years like no one's making money off a building that's decrepit like it's all for the love of the craft it's all for the documentary of like these places that are changing and I think that genre so maybe the Rushmore is a little split with the new topographic <laughs> people but that's it's, fun, it's yeah. cool to see that 
that transition, like that pass of the torch. And now we have a bunch of super talented people that I know, not just in the US, but overseas, who are like hardcore new topographic people. A lot of nighttime photographers, which is just hard to do in general, and just a lot of good work. So I think, you know, shout out to the, the Stephen Shores and like that, that kind of genre birth where like it wasn't as common. And it's still a little bit, a little avant-garde. Like people don't really know what a new topographic is, but if they see a sick, broken down car outside of a building, they're like, oh, I, that's, that's cool. So it's like, <laughs> I like, I really like that, that kind of body of work as well. What do you think the next big photography genre is going to be? Like, I'm sure there's people right now who are doing things that are innovating the game. Maybe it's not landscape, maybe it's mm. not street, maybe it's not portraiture. What do you think is going to be the future of the art form? Ooh, the future of the art form. That's yeah. interesting. Because I like a little bit of me looks at like little things like the, the digi cameras, like the shitty megapixel point and shoots. And I'm like, that's interesting, but that's like reflecting uh, an aesthetic people are looking after. Yes. Um, yeah. I think one of like the historic photographers, the Magnum side of the groups, like the, the Robert Franks and the Brissons, they talked about documentary being like the umbrella of photography. If you're a documentary photographer, for back in the day, you get to go anywhere and take photos of relevant topics happening in history, different like political or global issues, and like that's like the current, always up to date like version of photography. But the modern version of documentary is like kind of boring. Like not a lot of people are doing that. Um, it's a lot of newspaper style like like informational pieces. And I think there's gonna be a transition between that documentary work and this mix of like portraiture and street and new topographic and documenting a changing society. And I think that's at least what I'm looking out for. Like the most interested I am in work is when I see artists go do stuff like that. And like, for example, like Billy D, who's oh been across the internet, goodness. he just spent so much time overseas. Yeah. He's been to like India, he just came back from Vietnam. And I like look at his work, like excited to see like when you see someone go to a place and you're waiting for the work to come out, you're just like, dude, you don't understand. Dude, like every, dude. you know, no pressure, but everybody's waiting. Like we're <laughs> trying to eat and like the more good work you see, I think the better you get as a, as a photographer, as a person, like the more good work that surrounds you, everything's an influence and you're constantly pulled for different directions. So the more like healthy food you eat, just the better you get. And I think it's nice. I like root for the other people or any other person to take more photos like this is not a it's so funny because this is always a topic online but it's not like a competitive space like I've never yeah. felt a competitive nature in terms of like good work like when I see someone doing good work I want to see more of it and I hope they get there by any means and it's just like sometimes like FOMO is like this big aspect of social media like people don't even want to be online because FOMO hits way too strong and that's like fear of missing out on anything it's just one of those things where I don't see any competition in photography and art once people take photos for a long time I feel like your childhood and your life experience plays more and more of a role and you keep revisiting topics within that. Oh, for um, sure. And since so many yeah. people are so unique, once they get to that point where they're like, oh, I've seen a lot of the outside world, I wanna see my origin story and start to capture it, then you get like these giant, different bodies of work and you can't re like you can't mimic that like you've had so many life experiences that are unique to you like you can't go relive that life in your age and go see these things and your work's going to be different because of it so it's like whatever gets people to keep taking photos like you know people like you motivating people to go outside and take photos i think is the biggest push to that like you want a healthy generation of artists we're in this new era where like people are aware like you do have to pay artists you can't just rip a photo off the internet and post it as an ad for a blank company because right. that's actually legal but it's happened for so many years now it's like people advocating for the sake of like musicians the sake of photographers and it's so nice to see that in an era where like when you see something talented you see something good you ask, oh, who made that? Because you know it's not just like a blank commercial for like a soda company. Like someone made that and someone put the time and effort to make that, especially with photography where like you can't stay at home. The people who are so invested and like just love what they do and their driving desire to live is to create and make work, they typically don't see photography as a competition. Yeah. And I feel like that's probably something that, you know, moving forward, 
for people out there who may sometimes feel like that envy or that. I think we all feel that though. Yeah, yeah. These are normal time. feelings. Also, did we grow up in an era of like sports and team-based things? Like, I don't That's blame true. anybody for feeling competitive. I think it's like the most natural human reaction. Like, right. everybody wants friends because you want to have this tribe of people you connect with, and like yeah. that's so yeah. normal. Like it's so normal, and it shouldn't. You shouldn't feel bad about that. But like, not like envy is the thief of joy. Envy can ruin it for yourself. Like you yeah, can get absolutely. so frustrated that you're like, why am I not here? Or why can't I do that? Or I have these obligations, so I can't go travel. And it's just, you know, it would be nice kind of thing. That's an easy way to just bum yourself out. Like yeah, I don't, I don't time, know. Dude. Like it's, it's like you can't <laughs> fix everything. Life is not always fair. But you can change your life if you like really take it seriously and put it in your own hands. You don't have to do anything that you don't want to do in life and like it sucks to hear that because you're like shit like I have to go make this major change to change the lifestyle and living like that's like one of the biggest bummers when you realize like you can affect it. Um, so the com competition is I think just to combat that. People rather be like oh I don't know where I'm going but as long as I'm above this person it's yeah. like dude that as a dangerous path to walk and I hope people don't stay there but like I understand you know people starting there and if it like helps you change to a different place like it's not a sport it's not like team sports growing up like there's going to be some sitting by yourself in quiet uncomfortable thoughts self-reflecting and like at that point you don't get to compete against anybody, but if you make an enemy of yourself, you get into like a, just a dangerous mindset. And like everyone's been in that place where you just talk like just you're just rude to yourself and your internal like narrative. And I think like a big thing in my life growing up was boxing. My dad was a boxing coach, and recently Mike Tyson talked about like if you have to like down talk and be mean to yourself, you're gonna take it in to heart like you don't trust anybody as much as yourself so even when you get caught up in your head and you're like oh you suck fuck this fuck that um, yeah. you take it seriously because you're saying it as an internal dialogue and I when that yeah. I heard that I was like oh my god how true is that Very like you can hear people be rude to you on the street and it doesn't really bother you but when you're sitting alone in your thoughts late at night and you're the rude person to yourself like it just you're like, damn, it would be better to be your own friend than to be your own enemy. And I think that's the thing that comes out of competition. Because like, if you can still have that productivity and not have to compete against anybody else, you just enter this like new, I don't know, arena where yeah. you're not like focused on pushing something down. You're just focused on going that direction and seeing what's around you. What, what's a piece of advice? If you could give one piece of advice to photographers out there who want to progress and move forward mm. with something that you would kind of end them with? I think taking just opportunities to go have life experiences is great. Like just go on a trip with some friends, grab your friends, mm. go on a camping trip, go overseas, save up. Um, in terms of people who want to just do this for a living or just do this like in hyper repetition, I think for me, I like quit my job and hit the road way too early, way too fast. <laughs> I was gung ho, I was ready to make mistakes and I made plenty of them. I think uh, just being smart and like having like maybe a little side hustle or some way to like take the pressure off being able to go out and having free time, I think that's like one of the biggest things um, in terms of like getting to do something for a passion. Like you don't have to like switch your whole life up the next day and like sprint towards a direction that could be like dangerous. I think taking your spare time, really enjoying it, you don't have to work as a photographer. If you love photography, you never have to work for it. Because when you're working in photography, you do a bunch of projects you don't have to care about. You like don't love everything you have to work on um, in terms of business. But like if you do it as a passion, you get to do only what you love. And if that means like having a little side job or like finding certain ways to do it, doing it in your local area or like getting your friends into it. Cause like mm. if your buddies are into it, you get so ingrained so quickly cause you have someone to talk to. Um, so I think the biggest piece of advice, maybe above anything else, is like spend the time, you know, spend your time wisely and like do what you like 
with that available time. And if you can meet people with a similar passion mm -hmm. and you get to feed off of that instead of being like a person solely charging through and being the person breaking the trail and like having to discover a bunch of things. I've learned yeah. so many things from my friends. I've gotten friends just going on trips and going through hard situations with people and like you find that little community. You don't have to motivate yourself from scratch every single time. So, you know, not you don't have to switch up your life the next day to do it and you don't have to do this by yourself. Maybe that's the biggest thing. You don't have to do this by yourself. Yeah, this is not a solo experience, it's a group quest. Yeah. You get to have different people along for the ride. You get to meet interesting people and it can motivate you to push further and you don't have to take this whole burden of like figuring out everything for yourself. You find people who have similar interests. If you enjoy their company, it's even better and if, and eventually you get to go on some trips and take some photos and like when you look back, you get to have this just giant archive of memories um, and sometimes those memories are better shared than just by yourself. That's I think that's Chris from Camus actually. <laughs> I don't even know if that's me. <laughs> well, dude, it's been a pleasure to talk to you through this this interview, man. You, you've opened my eyes up to so many different levels of just the kind of the stuff we go through. I think you and I have a very similar background, so uh, it's nice to hear it. And uh, like you said, you know, we're both not crazy, man. Yeah. Thank you for your we're, time. We're just a little obsessed. Dude, yeah. I appreciate it. Oh, get oh. Here, dog. dude. Thank you. Thank you. I'm with a great right now. This is crazy. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> I had to redeem it with a little dab.